noisy Dalhousie crowd. Oh, right. Okay, so maybe we'll get going. Good morning again, everyone. So um, I think a whole lot of you went to some eye-openers this morning. I'm Diana hopkins Rossiel. I got to go to about 10 minutes of an eye-opener. Awesome, a little bit of pain for a lot of gain. And thank you for going to those. Also, we met some of our new timers this morning. And I would strongly suggest that you check out their name tags. It'll say, I'm a newbie. And give them a big hug and say, oh, there you are. It's a game. Oh, there you are. And then say, please come back again, and how can I help you? So I have no housekeeping for this morning. Um, and I'm going to get right away to introducing our very special plenary speaker. I have the privilege to introduce to you Major Marsha McRae. Um, Marsha McRae, Major McRae, is a serving member of the Canadian Armed Forces. And during her 21 years as a military physiotherapy officer, she served across the country, right across Canada, in multiple Canadian Forces bases, including here in Alberta. And most recently, Major McRae was stationed in Halifax, Nova Scotia, as the physiotherapy team leader and Atlantic regional practice leader. And she's got her whole cheering session over here, section over here saying, yeah, there they are the Eastern crowd. She's also had the opportunity to deploy on international missions to Bosnia in 2001, and most recently as a part of the mentoring mission Operation Attention in Kabul, Afghanistan in 2013. She completed her Master's in Rehabilitation Research in 2011 at Dalhousie University, um, where she focused her research on understanding the role of behavior change as it applies to physiotherapy practice. So this is an incredibly important area of practice. Yesterday at the opening ceremonies, we heard from our keynote speaker and astronaut, Dr. Robert Thirst, about space and about the body um, and the human body. Today we get a chance to change gears and not only to put boots on the ground, so to speak. That was for you, boots on the ground. I have no idea what it means. Um, but from the, uh, we go from the physical last night to the psychosocial today. The Congress Education Committee was really excited at the chance to explore through a physiotherapist's eyes and research our everyday realm of clinical practice from the behavioral side. So please welcome Major Marsha McRae as she takes us through her uh, address entitled Behavioral Change Techniques, the Potential in Physiotherapy Practice. Major McRae. Thank you. So much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very honored to be here today, and I'd like to thank the CPA for this opportunity. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you today is talk to you about today is behavior change in physiotherapy practice. I think that this is something that applies to all of our patients, whether they're young, they're old, um, whether they're an athlete, or whether they're the dockyard worker. And I think it's a very timely time to talk about this. I think it's very important in our practice. And uh, basically, I'd like to take you on a little journey about what I've learned over the last number of years about behavior change. So just as an overview, I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, uh, as to how I got interested in behavior change in physiotherapy practice. I'm going to talk a little bit about the experience of pain, behavior, and definition for it, why behavior change in physiotherapy, the theories of behavior change, the use of behavior change in physiotherapy practice, and then just a final thought. So first off, a little background. So I work at a Navy base. I have the absolute privilege of working at uh, Canadian Forces Health Services Centre Atlantic in Halifax, Nova Scotia, um, the East Coast Navy. So there's only two. There's the East and the West. The West will tell you they're best, but it's really the East. I can tell you it's all about the East. So, but what's nice about that is that we have a relatively stable uh, military population. So there's about 10,000 military members there, um, and there's not a lot of fluctuation, because once they're trained on that East Coast, they stay there. They don't really go to the West Coast all that much. And the other thing that we have as a really nice advantage in working in a military environment is that everyone who comes for rehabilitation has to come through our department. Um, so it provides us a really nice opportunity. It provides us an opportunity to see trends, perhaps, in our um, our patient population. The other thing it tends to do is perhaps uh, highlight our challenges, and that's the story I want to relate to you right now. So there was one morning, approximately six years ago, that one of our physios who had just come back from maternity leave was sitting in the clinic and expressing her concerns about returning 
uh, to physiotherapy after being away for a year. But then she started looking around the clinic, and she said, oh, is that Corporal Bloggins over there? And, oh, I think I recognize that guy too. That's so-and-so. Oh, and, and that's, that's somebody else. And, and she turned around at that point in time, and the words that kind of made me take pause were, wow, never mind, I think I'm going to be okay. It's just like I never left. And I thought, but you were gone for a year. I know these patients haven't been here for a year, so what exactly is going on? So I, it really made me stop and take pause and say, you know, what is it? Are we missing something? Now, perhaps in private practice, having those patients come back again and again is a good thing, right? From a revenue perspective, absolutely. But what we're really getting to the heart of is behavior change and trying to understand what it is that makes people do what they do. What brings them back into that clinic? Drives them to healthcare seeking, but it's also what drives them to do the exercises that they're doing uh, or not doing, which is probably a bigger frustration that we can all relate to. Um, trying to get the patients to do something that's going to be in the best interest of their health is really what's brought me to this point. And the big reason I think that we can all agree on that patients come to us is because of pain. That's what brings them in through our doors for the most part, and the related disability, I guess, as well. And I wanted to put these facts up here for you right now because I think it's really important just to kind of reiterate the problem with pain. And the problem being that, you know, despite all our medical advances and diagnostic tests, my gosh, we still have a big problem on our hand. There's something wrong there. When you look at these numbers, pain itself, chronic pain, and then you look at conditions like chronic musculoskeletal pain, um, in, uh, in low backs, and for me that's a big concern because what I can say is that in our practice in Halifax, about 30% of the people that come through our doors are coming through for chronic low back pain. And it's a challenge and it keeps us very, very busy trying to do something and sometimes you don't feel like you're getting very far with them, at least not if we look at it from a traditional approach. Now, having said that, the majority of our patients, if we look at this model, and I've kind of adapted it from uh, Linton and Shaw, but if we look at this model in terms of a nociceptive input coming into that patient, um, that patient is going to pay attention to that nociceptive stimulus. He's going to interpret it in terms of pain. We're there. We're there to help them cope. We're going to give them therapeutic modalities. We're going to help them with their exercises. And you know what? We're going to encourage them to you know, maintain those active behaviors, and they're going to go ahead, and they're going to meet their participation goals, and away they go. They're going to be fine. And that's the majority of our patients by far, or at least in most clinics. However, as we know, pain is not just about those straight factors. In some cases, it's really a much, much larger picture that we have to take into consideration, and that's this picture. Now, this again is from Linton and Shaw, and it's, um, I think, a, a very great visual way uh, of understanding how pain works with the psychosocial factors and the biological factors as well. So, if we just walk through this model, what we have then is a nociceptive stimulus, and again, that patient will pay attention to that nociceptive stimulus. That nociceptive stimulus gets the attention of the member, but it's not just a straight, let's go on, interpret the pain and how you go. You've got to take into consideration that member's emotions. Fear is a very, very powerful um, emotion. Depression or depressed mood, which is even more common, uh, they have a great impact on the amount of attention somebody actually pays to that nociceptive stimulus. So that, along with the beliefs, are they uh, believing that this episode of pain is, is, is going to be a, a bad episode for them? Is it, it really changed the amount of ten, attention that they place on that nociceptive stimulus. Then you've got cognitions. What are those thought processes, those perhaps um, uh, misguided lens, if you will, or a distorted lens that they're actually looking at that pain experience with that's going to impact their interpretation of that pain? And then there's the expectations. What does the patient actually expect from that pain experience? What do they expect from the actual treatment that they're going to receive? What do they expect is the outcome of this pain experience? It all fits into the interpretation and leads to a coping strategy, which eventually, of course, leads to a behavior. Now, that behavior, of course, is also impacted by the consequences of that behavior. So if that behavior, i.e., let's say they avoid whatever activity it is, and it decreases their pain, then that's great. That, that seems like a good thing to do. From a behavioral perspective, that seems great. And they will then learn from that experience. So 
that information is then fed back through this learning cycle, because we're, we're human beings, we learn as we go. It feeds back through that learning cycle and it affects again the beliefs, the cognitions, the expectations and the emotions, and on that cycle goes. Now the other aspect that fits into that is situation. And what we're talking about from a situational perspective is if for instance you have a patient who has injured his back uh, and has decided that I'm not gonna shovel today, that's not gonna happen because that's gonna increase my back pain. And lo and behold, his son, 18 years old, says, oh, it's okay, dad, you know, I'll go get that for you. I can go ahead and shovel. Well, unbeknownst perhaps to his son, he's actually gone ahead and encouraged that behavior as well because now the dad doesn't actually have to go ahead and shovel because somebody's already taken care of it for him. So there again, it's really influencing that behavior to continue going, okay? And I think we can see that when we look at this, it's all set as well within your, your culture, okay? Your family situation and your culture. So in Canada, for instance, in this environment, if I injure myself and I um, report to a hospital, I expect that I'm gonna have somebody who's educated come and take a look at me. I expect perhaps that I'm gonna need diagnostic procedures and I expect I'm gonna have a plan when I leave there. But uh, this is not necessarily the case, right, for everybody. In Canada, I will have certain emotions and certain expectations, certain beliefs and certain cognitions because I live in Canada. I can tell you if you lived in a place like Afghanistan, your emotions and your expectations and your cognitions and your beliefs would be very, very different. So it's very much influenced by that culture that you're, you're in as well. So if you take a look at this whole model, what you can see is that experience of pain is actually quite complex. There's a lot of factors actually playing into this. And it's really, really important that we recognize that there is this big model. And if we take actually a look at de the definition of behavior, um, it really is a response to a stimulus. Now, Fordyce in 1976 went back and looked at pain and said, you know what, pain itself is a behavior. And we can tell just from looking at the last model that it's hard to separate out a physical behavior or a physical movement from the actual um, psychosocial factors. It's a very interwoven, very, uh, you can't just pick out one factor, it doesn't work that way. Like I said, unless you've got those straightforward patients, which, you know, God help you, are lovely to have, but like I said, the other ones are the harder ones to treat, for sure. So why is behavior important? And I think that the big thing with uh, why behavior is important is that some behaviors do eventually lead to injury, okay? And that can be habits, that can be lifestyle behaviors. But it can also be the behaviors that result after injury. And those can promote or prolong uh, your recovery. Uh, and those are the ones that really concern us. Um, and like I said, when you are experiencing pain, it really does change how you move. So it's really important to have that, uh, that understanding. So behavior changes following injury. A lot of these won't be a surprise to you at all. Um, decreased activity, which of course may lead to deconditioning, periods of overactivity followed by underactivity, increased bouts uh, of rest contingent on pain, avoidance of movements of the injured body parts, splinting if you will, decreased ability to self-manage and that's that healthcare seeking that we talk about as well, taking analgesics or social isolation, are just a few of the ones that you might see. If we look to the psychosocial risk factors or the psychosocial factors that feed in, we consider those to be risk factors in terms of developing these poor behaviors and poor outcomes. Um, but like I said, it's so interwoven, it really is hard and I want you to understand it's hard to pick out one piece from the other. But um, there's been a lot of research into what psychosocial factors can actually um, be modified, because not all of them can be, right? If someone presents into your clinic, obviously, if they're having marriage troubles, well, not really something that you can do a whole lot about. But if they come in with fear of movement or depressed mood, there is actually something you can do about that. And as physios, that's what I really want to emphasize with you today. Not depression, but depressed mood. And like I said, depressed mood is much more common. Cognitions like catastrophizing that really extreme response to what should be a non-threatening stimulus. And it's, it's really um, blown way of proportion and, and uh, really heightens your sense of fear and emotions in there as well distorted pain cognitions, increased self-perceived disability, poor perceived control under the belief section, decreased readiness to change, expectations and, and 
planning and capability, things like lack of motivation are still looking for the answer. Um, and we see a lot of those, right? They're still looking for the answer. They just don't maybe like the answer that they've gotten, but they haven't gotten to that point yet. And then coping strategies, such as passive coping strategies, are definitely um, another one of these psychosocial risk factors. To put all this into context, what I want to show you is just the um, fear avoidance model. And uh, this is Linton's model from 2012. And basically, it just shows how it's a model you'll be familiar with if, you, you know, if you're treating chronic low back pain or anything like that. But basically, uh, the pain experience uh, with minimal fear, you go on and you'll recover, just like we've talked about, right? You have, uh, you confront your painful experience, you adapt, uh, you know, good behaviors, and you recover in, in predictable time frames. For others, however, they get into that, those cognitions, those cognitive sets where they just cannot get past that extreme um, fear, the, the poor thoughts that lead them to fears, and the fears leading to avoidance, the avoidance leading to actual physical consequences, and that's your disability, your depression, your disuse. And this is where it impacts us, right? These are the guys that, that walk through our door, and we've got to do something about it, and they don't respond to that straightforward model. And that's really important for us to, to understand. So what does the research say? Um, in terms of what they, um, the psychosocial risk factors, how do they feed in? Well, they do ex influence the experience of pain from the acute, right through, the acute, sorry, right through to the chronic stages. Um, they also predict delayed recovery. And they can influence patient outcomes, and that's disability, function, participation, and healthcare seeking. And they act as a catalyst, and they can transition acute to chronic pain. And that's where it's so important for us. Like if there's something that we can do to prevent that transitioning, if there's something that we can do to, to decrease those, uh, you know, the disability, the outcomes, then it's, it's great. That would be a fantastic opportunity for us. To really understand how this works, we really have to dive into the theories of behavior change. And, um, you know, this world, behavior change comes from the psychology world, absolutely. But, understanding these theories really shows how we in practice can actually implement them in physiotherapy as well. So I think it's really important to take a look and see how, um, how theory, what the theories are basically is how we go about and change behaviors. So there are tons of theories out there, absolutely. And it's not much wonder it's, it's hard to implement this practice in physiotherapy. It's overwhelming almost to look at. But basically the research has told us that if we, can base our treatments on theoretic theories, behavioral change theories, then perhaps there's a better chance of having positive outcomes with that. And there's three theories that are related to chronic pain and uh, chronic low back pain that I really want to share with you today. Um, and some of them will be more familiar than the other. Operant learning theory should be something that's pretty familiar to most physios. And I think it's something that we actually do really well um, and I don't know that uh, perhaps we think about it in those times, uh, in that framework so much. But really what operant learning theory talks about is um, addressing behavior change through behaviors. The biggest predictor of a behavior is uh, the response to past behaviors. And so if you modify the behavior and um, the feedback to that behavior is positive, like we talked earlier when we talked about the experience of pain, then that behavior will be continued. If there is negative consequences with that behavior, then it will be discontinued. So does the research support that? Absolutely. It says it's a promising strategy for physio and the prevention of chronic low back pain. I think this theory appeals to uh, us, or at least it can get used in physiotherapy a lot more, is because it really does deal with the physical behavior just as we are physical therapists. We can relate to that. We can relate to the actual movements that we want to improve uh, and, and get that patient back on the road. Um, the criticism with this theory is that it doesn't take into account the cognitions, um, that whole side, the cognitions and the emotions. But having said that, we have to remember that we are very much experiential learners. And we think back again to that pain model, the experience of pain, and how we learn, right? We learn from our behaviors. So if that behavior that we perform um, has positive outcomes and we continue that behavior, well, of course we're gonna learn from that and it's gonna change our beliefs and it's gonna change the way that we think and it's going to change 
um, the emotions and it's going to change the fears associated with it. It feeds back to it, absolutely. Social cognitive and the related self-efficacy theory. So these are really interesting theories and I, I think there's a huge applicability in physiotherapy and the treatment of chronic pain and chronic low back pain. Um, and if you ever get to read any of Bandura's work, it's, it is very, very interesting. But self-efficacy theory um, really focuses in on the beliefs, the cognitions, and the coping strategies, the performance of behaviors. But what it posits is that um, if a person believes that they can do the behavior and they can see the value in doing that behavior, then they will continue with the behavior. So if you tell me I have to go home and I have to do 30 repetitions of a, an arm curl because my bicep is weak, but I don't get any idea how that's ever going to apply with, to what's really important to me, i.e., um, I don't know, writing my book, then I'm probably not going to do it because I really don't see the applicability. I don't see the need. Where is it going to actually address what I want to do? And self-efficacy and its related self-cognitive theory or uh, social cognitive theory is really what underlines a lot of your chronic pain management programs. It's really about improving that, that, um, that ability, that ability to believe that we can do something and then to see the importance of doing that, okay? See the need of doing that. And in the research, yes, self-efficacy is uh, definitely linked with um, successful changes in patient behaviors and in decreases in disability um, when we look at uh, chronic low back pain. And the last theory I want to talk to you about is cognitive behavioral therapy, or sorry, theory. And cognitive behavioral theory does exactly that. It looks at the cognitive and it looks at the behavioral side. Um, and the underlying premise to that uh, theory is that it is really the maladaptive thoughts that are driving a behavior, okay? That's the reason that that behavior exists. But we are conscious learning individuals. We have the ability to actually go back and think about what it is that we are doing. We can go back and step back. It's a, such a unique thing as a human being, right? Be able to step back from the situation and go, okay, does that thought actually make sense? Yes or no? That doesn't make sense. No, my back is not breaking into a million and one pieces. No, my muscle is not ripping apart. That doesn't make sense. Okay, so you can get conscious control over those thoughts. And by getting conscious control of those thoughts, you can change your beliefs in a conscious way as well, all right? And by doing that, you can actually have some control over calming down your fears. And that in itself is what will drive that behavior, okay? So you have the ability. That ability to actually change how you are thinking, change what you are, are doing and stop in the moment um, is what basically changes. And one of the interesting things about cognitive behavioral th uh, theory is that it really talks about the important role of getting in there and, and really being positive to the patient and really highlighting their successes and, and, and making a big deal of those accomplishments so that they can reinforce, right, I did good, I did really well. And uh, again, that's just influencing those behaviors as you go. So again, there's strong evidence for decreasing pain and improving function when we actually use this type of theory. Um, behind behavior change principles. So let's talk about physiotherapy and behavior change. Where do we actually fit in? So when we look at the research, um, like I said, behavior change has so, for so long been in the psychology realm, okay? Mental health nurses and social workers, they get into that aspect as well, but it's really been out there. We're physical and that's out there. Um, there's a lot of research out there that's actually stating, no, you know, we, we can't. We have, to, we have to devolve this to larger numbers of people. And uh, uh, physiotherapy, uh, the physiotherapy profession is perfectly poised for that. The amount of time we have with our patients, um, the ability that we have to develop these relationships with our patients and actually be able to implement some of this stuff, we're perfectly poised for that. And not only that, if you think about it, we know what these behaviors and psychosocial risk factors can do to our actual outcomes. So they can impact those outcomes. So if we can potentially go back and influence some of these, perhaps we can see better outcomes at the other side as well. And you know, why wouldn't we take advantage of that? 
physiotherapists themselves have noticed uh, the importance of incorporating these types of uh, factors, the psychosocial and the, and the behavioral type of factors, into uh, treating certain conditions like chronic low back pain. And of course, they, um, there are guidelines out there for chronic low back pain that definitely suggest biopsychosocial approaches and the incorporation of all of these. So there's nothing, you know, that shouldn't come as a surprise either. But, oops, sorry. But the big thing with this is that despite the fact we may recognize it, we still don't necessarily do it. So it's not routinely assessed. Maybe we don't know how to assess it. And it's not routinely utilized um, to the best of its ability. Now, like I said, there's not tons of research out there on how we actually implement behavior change. So, you know, it, it, there's probably good reason why this isn't being implemented on wide scale. In certain settings, it's definitely harder to do, right? Um, having time, the time to do it, having the, the proper location to do it, the right setting to do it, definitely those are all factors. But there hasn't been tons of research, but the research that's been done basically says exactly that. It's not routinely assessed, and it's not utilized sufficiently. Generally, when we look at behavior change in physiotherapy, it's not well studied anyway. Um, there's lots of individual uh, clinical trials that have run um, using, say, operant learning theory, and then there have been other ones that have incorporated uh, more of these psychosocial and biological factors or looking at behavior change, but not tons. So that's where my question came to be, is what exactly is it that we do? And as a um, physiotherapist, I was really, really interested in what role we could potentially play. When I got looking through the literature, it's very hard actually to kind of figure out what it is that we do. Um, it's quite diversified and it's not easy to follow. And there's a whole lot of theories out there. What do you start with? Where do you go? So that was my master's thesis. I went back and I took a look and I said, you know what, I want to know what it is that physiotherapists can do to influence behavior. And basically, I went back and took a look at what behavioral change techniques we actually can use in practice. Now there's the difference. So psychology can go ahead and psychologists can go ahead and put in um, cognitive behavioral therapy, for instance, okay? We don't do cognitive behavioral therapy. We wouldn't, wouldn't step into the realm, and I think they would probably have issues with it if we did. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about applying things like cognitive behavioral therapy. What we're talking about is actually taking behavior change techniques and applying it to our patients and the risk factors that they might have to have poor, or that may lead to poorer outcomes. So I took a look back on the research and I looked at physiotherapy um, and came up with a whole list of behavior change, very different from one article to another, but a whole list of behavior changes. And then I looked over to the psychology world, because like I said, this is where it came from, right? This is where it, it initiated. And there was a, a behavior change techniques checklist that they had developed, and only in 2008, uh, so not that long ago. Uh, and basically, that, that was a summary of behavior, behavior change techniques in health behaviors, encouraging physical activity, some of it with addiction. So it was a cross of, of different behavioral change techniques that were used in psychology. So once I kind of took those two lists and, and put them together and kind of deleted everything that was extra, I sent them out to physiotherapy experts that have worked in behavior change. A lot of their papers, basically everyone I read that had a paper on this, I sent a survey out to them and I said, you know, you don't know me, but I would really love your opinion and let's see what, what you guys have to say. Do you think that this is something that's important for physiotherapy? What came back and what resulted from that was a, a behavior change checklist uh, behavior change techniques checklist for physiotherapists. And basically it's, it's 29 techniques, and, uh, which I thought was pretty good actually, uh, in terms of what, what is in the realm of possible for physio. We created definitions for those techniques so that we could go ahead and take a look and see exactly how you operationalize it. Because it's not gonna be the same in a psychology context as it would be in a physio context, right? Makes sense. So what we found was that there were actually 11 behavioral techniques. So those ones mostly focused on moving, the behavior, right, the physical behavior that you see, um, and really encouraging patients to move correctly despite fears um, and in various environments. There were also 10 that were cognitive, so really getting at uh, changing their thoughts and their pain and preparing for any upcoming challenges that they may experience with their pain, setbacks, barriers, what have you. 
And then we found eight motivational, or we classified it as eight motivational, that basically were about giving the patient control. So if we take a look at, just for example, some of the behavioral techniques, graded exposure, now these ones will probably seem a little bit more familiar to you because we're in the behavioral realm, okay? So the physical behaviors, that's us, right? We're all about the physical. So graded exposure was uh, one that came up. It's not done probably quite as frequently because there's, it's a bit more of a stepwise process and it does take a little bit more time and it involves basically going and um, identifying uh, fears, patient fears, uh, in a hierarchy, and then going back and, and basically exposing that patient to those fears in a hierarchy. The intention with that is that you go back and you challenge that emotion of fear, and you try to decrease that, that fear um, for the patient. And by decreasing that, we also attenuate that, that signal um, of the nociceptive stimulus. The attention is actually decreased, so you kind of adjust to it, you accommodate to it, if you will, because you're now used to getting exposed to whatever the case may be. Pacing, again, something that's bread and butter for us, right? That's so much a part of what we do. However, having said that, it is amazing how many patients have no clue how to go ahead and pace themselves. It's amazing the cognitive sets you get in about, I have to get it done. I have to shovel for four hours and I have to get this driveway done. There's no other way. And I said to my, one of my patients one time, I said, why, why do you have to do it? Why is that so important to you? He said, because I really don't want my wife to be seen out there. He said, I'll look really bad if she's out there actually shoveling. And I thought, really? That's your, that's your, that's your reasoning? That's really interesting. But those are the kinds of things that, that block them from, from pacing. And they'll tell you that. Like, it might take a while, right? You have to establish that relationship with the patient. But really, you can figure out all these things from the patient themselves. They'll tell you everything you need to know. You just have to have the time and the patience to go ahead and ask them. So pacing, I mean, very important and very, very pertinent to what we do. Setting graded activities or exercises is really, again, we do it as physios, right? Obviously, exercises are bread and butter. But it's really about establishing a step-by-step -step, um, uh, process for achieving these different uh, levels of exercise. And that really involves a lot of sitting down with a patient and finding out what it is. What is your goal? Okay, what do we have to do to get there? What's important to you and how do we do it? So the behavioral side, this is just a few, so you, you kind of get a, a concept of that. And I think you can all relate to those. Now, motivational and cognitive techniques, just to throw out a few. So visualization, um, for us, visualization is really visualizing at-risk behaviors, all right? And um, what we're really getting at, again, is the attention side of things, okay? How do we decrease the attention that they pay to that nociceptive stimulus. If they are um, concerned about something, so for instance, our guys on the ships, they know they're gonna go back and they're gonna have to store the ship, which is a lot of lug and everything that you have to get on board that ship all has to be done by hand. And it is an absolute amazing thing to see, this line of 100, 200 people chucking things for two or three hours to load that ship in uh, so that they can leave port. And it, it's demanding. and. They are horrible at it, absolutely horrible. Their movement is crazy. So it's not much of a wonder that something like that is an at-risk behavior. But what we would do is spend a lot of time with a patient and really um, um, teaching him the proper way to move um, and, and really getting him to visualize that at-risk behavior. Okay, so how are you going to implement those movements? And as he goes through it visually, it actually helps decrease that attention and decrease his fear around that particular activity. So it really does help to deal with and, and dampen, if you will, that nociceptive stimulus and lead to a different interpretation of, the, uh, of that stimulus itself. So problem solving and dealing with flare-ups. Um, again, something that I think that we do, whether or not we do it to the degree that we perhaps need to sometimes is a good question. Really, it's about that patient being able to take care of themselves after they have left that clinic. So, when you're talking about patients with chronic pain or chronic low back pain, they're gonna run into bumps. Absolutely, they're gonna run into bumps. It's part of being or having chronic pain. But if, if you can collaborate with that patient and have them kind of figure out, well, what does it really mean? Okay, so it means that I may have a pain for a couple days. It's okay, it's okay. All right, that's a good thing, it's okay. Okay, but how am I gonna deal with it? Well, I'm going to, make sure I move, I'm going to uh, make sure that I, I, you know, I don't curl up in bed and, and not move. I, you know, 
basically it's going through a making a plan and that way they really are improving again their self-efficacy right they they are figuring out how they can go ahead and perform um, a behavior and they can see that if they can do that behavior then it'll decrease their pain and they can get back to activity so that that's great it's putting the power back in their hands which is really what we want to do at the end of the day cognitive restructuring again I don't think this is a, anything new for us either right we get these patients in with these um, persistent thoughts that they have and we are wanting them to change those thoughts you know hurt equals harm and oh I can't ever bend again and I well that's that's not exactly true so this is what you you know movement is good you know we, we want you to actually be moving and and you know that keeps you um, keeps the joints moving it keeps the muscles healthy it's you know you front load them with that information and and restructure their thought processes and help them you know work if you think back to the cognitive behavioral therapy right oh okay right step back think about what I'm thinking no it doesn't mean the end of the world and it doesn't mean I'm going to be held up for the next three months with pain it's just a little bump in the road it's okay pain is just a message right so it really helps them to cope and it really helps to manage their expectations as well so prompting self-monitoring of behavior is another one that I want to talk to and prop prompting self-monitoring of behavior is exactly that and again I think we do this all the time in uh, in physio as well is we get patients to okay am I doing this right yeah no 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 that's that's not right okay I, I've got to fix this um, okay and I'm also gonna go home I have to make sure that I'm doing these exercises when I'm walking and I have to make sure that I'm doing these so I come back tomorrow and I can say to my physio yeah you know no it was good I I walked uphill and I I was really careful about I, I really made sure that I was moving normally I wasn't you know bending through my back or whatever the case may be uh, yeah absolutely getting them to check in really again putting that that um, focus back on the patient and prompting is a really interesting word uh, and it was a word that came out of the psychology checklist and it wasn't one that I was really um, I hadn't really realized the significance of it when I first uh, dove into this work but prompting prompting really engages that patient all right not providing the answers which is I think something that we do in physio all the time oh you have this and you need to do this and that's a, a trap that we can get into and it's something that I think we can correct really really easily you can take that and put that back in the patient's hand and say okay so what do you think you should do here do you think that's good for you prompting and, and really putting that that onus back on them so that was all great I had this great checklist theoretically it seemed to make sense everything was uh, hunky-dory but my question was okay great we've got this checklist but does it actually work in physio practice like do we actually do these things a lot of them I knew we did right the behavioral side is very very easy to say yeah absolutely we do those that's that's physio but I wasn't exactly sure how much the other ones would actually fit in so what we did is we went and took a look at our six-week um, back to fitness class which is a class designed for paid patients with chronic low back pain but still pretty high functioning for the most part but there are people that would be coming back to us over and over again uh, in terms of uh, needing care so um, it's run two sessions per week uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays there's a an education session for about 15 to 40 minutes and then it's got a lecture session or sorry an um, individual exercise session and then the, on the Thursday is actually a circuit training session so it's taught by two therapists but one of the therapists was in and out of it so we kind of primarily looked at the practice of one physio and this is what we um, whoops my mistake this is what we found so I thought wow look at this I know this graph looks probably well too much but I'll, I'll explain to you step by step so the black basically represents the lectures the white represents that individualized exercise session and the gray represents the circuit training session the behavioral cognitive and motivational are the different groups of those behavioral change techniques the most we could have seen were 16 because we just basically observed to see if they occurred in that class we didn't count frequency we just looked to see if they occurred what I think is really amazing is okay this physio we didn't prime her with anything we didn't give her any information on what we'd found in the research we just went in with this checklist and we said what's she doing let's take a look and well lo and behold she was doing 24 of those techniques uh, 24 to the 29 which I thought was actually really incredible there's only five that she wasn't doing um, and they were uh, setting graded activities um, which in a group setting um, probably could have been done but it, it, 
there were other ways around it, and she found different things to do um, that worked a little bit better for patients. Um, it was things like graded exposure, booster sessions, which we wouldn't have observed at the time anyway. That's just the follow-up for patients. Um, but at the end of the day, for the most part, like she did a lot of them, and she did a lot of them in a lot of the different settings. Like in, in that educational session, in that individual exercise class, and in the circuit training. So she was really pumping the same message out. So what it told me was that, wow, this is, this is what we do, absolutely. And it seems like it's a bit of a process. But what I wasn't sure was how exactly we did it. And we watched all this on video. So we had taped everything and watched it on video and, uh, and went back and, and, and took a, a closer look at it. And there were a couple of techniques that I have to say were very interesting and very big learning steps for me. And they were uh, facilitating internal reinforcement and modeling. Now, both of these things come back to self-efficacy and uh, the social cognitive theories. And facilitating internal reinforcement is really about having a patient take credit for their successes. It's about having a patient take all that stuff that they've learned cognitively and apply it, um, and making sure that they understand what's right and what's wrong. Um, uh, watching it, how other people move and, and, oh, is he doing that right? Is that the way it's supposed to be? There's something off with that. It's really about teaching them to be able to go ahead and, and do it. And then when they make that success, it's really celebrating. You did great. That was fantastic. Of course you're feeling better because, you know, you went home and did your exercises and you did them correctly, et cetera, et cetera. So that technique, like I said, was very, very frequently seen throughout the practice. And it was always posed again in, in that, that questioning um, uh, manner. So it was, never, it was never something that was um, uh, stated to the patient. It was always something that you know, you're, you're really trying to have them acknowledge and have them recognize that they have done it. It's always about putting it back on the patient. Modeling was the other one that was a, just a big wow for me. And again, Bandura's got some, he's done some really nice work and that's, it's old, it's old stuff. But I mean, it's in the heart of psychology and it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And what modeling is, is exactly that. It's, it's the patient do, physically doing an activity, which again, we do all the time in physio. But it's also taking advantage of other people um, doing certain behaviors and allowing that patient to learn from that. So the way that Bandura talks about it is that um, experiential learning, so doing it yourself is the best way to enhance that behavior, right? Doing it yourself confirms your knowledge of that behavior. Yeah, I can do it, it feels great, excellent. But you can also be influenced by the therapist teaching, okay, and showing that particular activity or relating a story um, concerning, oh, this is what I had and this is how I recovered. But what Bandura says is that the most powerful models and the most powerful things to influence our behavior are the ones that we can most easily relate to, okay? So the therapist is the instructor, probably doesn't have back pain, or at least is controlling it really well and not showing it. So they may not be able to relate to that person, but boy, they sure can relate to the other patients in that class. And I've gotta say, in the military, we do everything in training, like in groups. Absolutely everything. So a group made sense for our military, but it actually really is a nice environment to go ahead and see things like how modeling actually works. And what you would see is patients actually going ahead and demonstrating um, these different activities. And you know, you could see patients actually take a look at that and go, wow, geez, he's in as much pain as me and he's doing that. Or Two days ago, he was in as much pain as me, but now look at him. Or that other patient in the class coming in and going, you know what, first time in four years, I've actually been able to go home and I've been able to unload my, my trailer. The wood is all stacked. He's, I'm so pleased with myself. Well, how did you do that? Well, I went home, you know, and I, I really did. I sat down and I paced, I took breaks, I made sure I was moving properly. I did it all, like I, I did it all and this is the result that happened. Now this patient sitting back here listening to this story, well, he can relate to that. He absolutely can relate. So that, although it's not him experiencing it, it, it really has a, an incredibly powerful effect uh, on that patient. And it's something that's really nice to take advantage of in a patient environment. Now the other type of modeling that was interesting as well is, is a role modeling where you can actually use someone like a, a, a sports superstar. 
And in this particular case, we had a gentleman who always had pain after he played hockey. So we took a look at how he actually was standing, and he was quite, quite flexed over through his spine when he was playing, and he wasn't getting good hip movement in there. So you know, we, we talked to him, we tried to kind of cognitively get him to understand the importance of that movement, and you know, if he, you know, trying to attach it to what he wants to do, return to hockey pain-free pain and the whole bit. But what it took, now granted, we're in Halifax, Cole Harbor's just across the bridge, but it took a picture of Sidney Crosby on the ice in that exact position with his back in a nice neutral position and his hips nicely flexed for that patient to go, oh, I get it. I get it. Oh. Oh, so I believe him. Actually, we've been talking to you for ages and you haven't believed us, but you believed him. But that's great. That's fantastic. I think it's really important that you understand that those things can come into play and really influence those behavior changes. So what I wanted to do right now is I just wanted to play a little video for you that um, kind of shows how some of this uh, stuff plays out so you can actually have that, that visual. And I don't know how good the audio is, but I may have to interpret here for you. So this is a patient and she's in the back class. This is just a week and a half ago. Okay, so just so we're clear, so this is only three sessions into the back class, so um, she's obviously got some movement issues there, I think that's all pretty obvious to all of us, but if you notice, Selene is our therapist here, and she's come up to the patient and she said, now how are you doing? How, how is that feeling? How do you think about that, that movement, that behavior? How are you doing? She's never said, okay, you're, you're way off. Um, can you tell that you're shifting? Can you tell that you're doing this? She's, she's very much started in stimulating that patient and saying, how? How are you doing? Okay. So, Dennis has Carol to uh, All right, Probably a little too fast, I'd say. A little bit too fast, that's exactly. Yeah. It's a good East Coast accent coming out there. She had asked, she looked around the class and she said, who out here do I need to have going back and thinking about how he moves and whether or not he's actually learned about how he's supposed to move? So she turns around to Dennis and she says, Dennis, how is she moving? So still she hasn't gone to this patient and said, oh, you're, you're totally shifted. You're da -da. No, she's gone to another patient. How is she moving? And of course it's only three sessions in, so he hasn't got all the concepts down yet. You're going a little too fast, which was absolutely right. The patient was going a little too fast. A whole lot of other big problems going on there too. But that turning and, and engaging everybody in, you know, looking around and seeing how exactly that, that works out is, uh, is really powerful. <laughs> and our mirror's coming. coming so what you're doing, and you're probably getting tired, because you've been doing that for six, six people, okay, is that you are shifting your weight quite a bit. All right. So how would you try to do this so that it would make your movement pattern look better? <laughs> So again, she's just doing more of the same prompting. She's, so how could, you, how could you make this different? And the patient really, really is stretching. I could lay on the floor and do this. Oh, but you know, is there any other way that's perhaps a bit, bit more functional? And so now, I mean, she has to come around and give her the answer. But what's interesting is as you go through this class, so we started, like I said, at, at week one and we went right through to week six. What's interesting is that by the end of that, six weeks, what you really see is the physio is withdrawing more and more and more every time. And eventually, it's the patients that are answering back, oh, Joe, you're, no, you're not doing that right. You have to, da, 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 da. Oh, no, I have, this is what I did last night, and this is what I had the problem. Oh, well, then you should try this. This is what I found work. And it's really fascinating to watch this, how much you can learn. They can learn from each other. They really use themselves, uh, each other as models and they really um, go back and, and are able to um, influence uh, each other's behaviors at that point in time. So basically, 
when it comes to facilitating internal reinforcement and, and the modeling, that really, like I said, goes back to the self-efficacy and it goes back to um, the ability to, or the encouraging the patients not only to learn the technique, but understand the need. You have to make that hook, right? You have to tap into something that's important to them and it has to tap into their goals, whether it be the guy who wants to return to hockey, it takes Sidney Crosby, seeing Sidney Crosby to actually make him make that jump. It, you know, prepping them and, and front-loading them with that information. But I think at the end of the day, what you can think about as a physio is that there are a whole lot of techniques that are really available to you um, as physios to, to influence behavior. In order to make them work, however, I think the three things that you have to understand is that you really have to spend some time and gain that patient's trust, all right? You have to spend some time getting to know it. The best way to do that, there's actually a really nice paper out by uh, Parsons in uh, 2007, I think it was, and it was on expectations, uh, and it was expectations with, uh, between patients and, and GPs. And basically what came out of that paper was that patients went to that doctor expecting a certain outcome. They expected that that doctor was going to believe them, and they expected to be taken seriously. They expected that that doctor was going to trust them, and in turn, they would provide trust to that doctor. And I think that's a really important point uh, to remember is that we really have to establish that trust, because if you don't have that trust, and you don't, you're not gonna get that patient uh, believing anything is going to happen. And so it's really important to set that stage, and the best way to gain that trust is to listen to your patient. Really listen. They'll tell you everything you need to know. They'll tell you what it is they need to tell you. And then they're gonna tell you what's important to them. So you really have to figure out what's the hook. What's the thing that they need to do in order to make that, that behavior change happen? So get their trust, find out what it is that's important to them, establish their need. And once you've established the need, you help them, you coach them in terms of finding their own solutions. It's easy as physios, I think, to turn around, like I said, and, and provide the answer. It's easy and it's faster, right? And it works. It works for so many of the patients, but not so much for these patients. And I think that's, that's the key that I really want you to take home with that. But in conclusion, what I want you to remember is pain is really much more complex than just that nociception. Behavior pay, plays a role in the relation to the experience of pain Modification of these behaviors may alter the experience of pain, transmission, or sorry, transition to chronic pain and treatment outcomes. An understanding of the theoretical basis for behavior change may assist with the application of behavior change techniques. There are a whole lot of behavioral change techniques available to us, but really at the end of the day, it comes down to listening to what the patient has to say. And I think as a final thought, what I really want to impart to you is I think that um, as a profession, we have a huge potential to influence behavior change in physiotherapy practice. And I believe exploring that, that potential really can only help our patients in the end. I thank you very much for your time. Awesome. Thank you, oops, my light's on. Um, I would just love to thank um, Major McRae for such a wonderful talk this morning. Um, she started out with the complex, as you know, and there's a 29-piece checklist of behavioral techniques, and then she distilled it down to something I think we can all walk away with, which is really nice. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the Canadian Physiotherapy Association and all of the delegates here, I'd love to thank you for the talk and give you just a little bit... Oh bit of a prize and it feels like something you might want tonight. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so again. much. Thank I appreciate you. that. And I would, um, I would really like to thank all of you for coming. I'm going to encourage you to move along very quickly to the next session. Um, but also let you know that Major McRae will be at the CPA booth at 10 o'clock if you'd like to speak with her one-on-one. -on -one. I'm sure she'd be love to, love to share and answer your questions. Thank you.